I think that her impression on the jury was... I mean, he writes his scripts when he is performing roles. And this is no different. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts. And in this video, I'm going to do an in-depth analysis of Ben Chu and Camille Vasquez in some interviews that they did talking about their client, Johnny Depp. We're going to look at their body language. We're going to look at their behaviors and try to see what they're really thinking about this whole case. Okay, so some of you have some question marks about what's going on here, and I'm going to address that. So last week, I did a video on Elaine Bredehoff, Amber Heard's attorney, as she did interviews just like these ones. And first of all, I want to thank you very much for the feedback. You guys had some amazing things to say. But in that video, I said that that was going to be the last one that I do about Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. And then when these interviews happened, I was like, oh, what do we do? Do we reopen this chapter of our lives? So I went to my community page right here on YouTube and I asked you, the subscribers, what do you want? And it wasn't even close. An overwhelming majority was like, no, we want this analysis. So here I am telling you, I, I don't know if this is the last one. Apparently, I'm clueless as to what's going on. So let's leave it open-ended. Let's see what happens and let's not put anything off the table. That being said, let's jump right into this analysis. So we have four different interviews. We have both Camille and Ben on Good Morning America. We have both of them on the Today Show. And then we have just Ben Chu on the Law and Crime channel on YouTube where he did some interviews and on Court TV, where he did a solo interview as well. And I'm gonna mix and match uh, some of these interviews. It's not gonna be one than the other. And after this analysis, I'm gonna even do an update on last week's video, because there was a couple of topics that got a lot of great conversation going on in the comments, and I'm gonna address those and answer some questions that you guys had. So it's gonna be a fun one. Let's start now. During your cross-examination, what was your impression of Ms. Hurd's uh, impression on the jury? I think that her impression on the jury was what it was. I think something that I focused on and we focused on in that cross-examination was using her words against her. And it was very important for us to every question that was asked was tied to something she had said previously. Okay, so we're starting with one of my favorite questions and answers from all these interviews. And it's directed to Camille Vasquez and she's being asked what she thinks the jury thought of Amber Heard. So the first thing we notice is a grooming gesture. She fixes her hair before she answers. And this is something we see quite often with Camille. Just before she's about to take a question, she will see this kind of fixing her hair. Now, grooming gestures are things that are very common just before we speak or present something. You might see someone fix their collar, fix their hair, adjust you know, the, the, the cuffs on their shirt, uh, even licking of the lips to appear more presentable. Now on the channel, I talk a lot about clusters of deception. These are behaviors that when we see multiple at the same time, they raise the probability that somebody is being deceptive. And grooming is part of a cluster, but this is a great example as to why a cluster is necessary. Because in this case, there's nothing else going on that would indicate in any way that she intends on being deceptive. In this case, the grooming is just that, you know, just fixing herself before she answers. That's it. I love what happens next. The camera cuts to her and we see her looking to the side with this tight-lipped smile. And this is something we often do when we're just looking for the right words to say. We need a moment of pause and that's what's happening. Then we see her eye flutter and eye flutter is whenever we're processing information. So whether we're struggling with something that we're going to say or taking in information, eye flutter is just processing information typically. And now she's looking up and she's just searching. She's just looking for the right thing to say here. We see her eyes continue to search as she goes back to the side. We see another tight-lipped smile as she's desperately trying to find the right word. And then she finally comes up with, I think the jury's impression was what it was. That's the best she's got. My interpretation of this is that in that moment, she's going through the first 50 words that she would use to describe what the jury thought of Amber Heard, and she's going, no, nope, can't use that, can't say that on TV, no, nope, that one's not good. Uh, you know what, it was what it was. Almost like, I think we all know what it was. Next, we see a really significant pronoun shift. So she's answering this question in I, which makes sense, because she was asked what her opinion is. Then she says, I focused on, and shifts, edits. We focused on, and looks over to Ben, we focused on using her words against her. Something that I focused on and we focused on in that cross-examination was using her words against her. And from now on, she uses us, because she. after that she goes, that was really important for us. 
So there's a pronoun shift that we actually see because she goes, I focused on, we focused on. And I think in that moment, she's trying to say, this was a group strategy. I think it's also a little bit of her saying like that sort of aggressive vibe that we saw there. That's not typically me. That was, that was something we decided as a group and that's what I was bringing out. I was a spokesperson for what was important to us. I want you to pay attention to something that's happening in that answer that's going to be a theme for both Ben Chu and Camille Vasquez throughout these interviews and I find really admirable and it's this. She was given a completely open opportunity here to slam down on Amber Heard. She was asked flat out, what do you think the jury thought of her? Now, we have a verdict who speaks for itself. We have social media, pretty much everyone pointing out how Amber's sort of testimony or cross-examination was a train wreck for Amber. And Camille has this opportunity right here to praise herself, to elevate herself, to say how much of a train wreck it was. She does not take that opportunity. She just talks about, you know, how it was what it was and this was our strategy. She sticks to talk about their strategy and she very politely declines this opportunity to completely demolish Amber Heard. She chooses the higher road and doesn't take that. They're both gonna do this a lot throughout these interviews and I personally find it really admirable. I'm sure you've seen Elaine Brederhoff's comments after the verdict saying that the jury was tainted by the publicity, that there was suppressed evidence. What's your reaction to that? I was really disappointed to hear that because she's a very good lawyer, very um, experienced, and it seemed to cast aspersions on the jurors' integrity because, as you know, they took a, an oath. Right. She points to medical records, uh, text messages from Stephen Duders, things like that. Would that have made a difference? Can you enlighten us on... I don't believe any of the evidence that was excluded, and there was evidence excluded on both sides, and you're very familiar, there are rules of evidence that apply. I think Her Honor, you know, played it right down the middle, was very consistent in her rulings, and I, I think it's an improper characterization, and perhaps she just misspoke. Okay, quite a bit to unpack there. First of all, in my analysis of Elaine, I said that she had these sort of pre-written answers, and any time a question would come out, she would almost ignore it and play the answer that she wants to put there and a lot of the wording, a lot of the cadence, it was presented the exact same way. In a lot of cases here, we get the same words, the same sort of little phrases, but often what happens before and after is very different. But there's a couple of words that come up a lot. One of them is disappointed, disappointment. I think that was very disappointing to hear. And again, that suggestion was, was disappointing to hear. I think it's disappointing. I was really disappointed to hear that. I think it's disappointing. And I feel like this is something that, I don't know if they discussed it beforehand, but Ben Chu and Camille Vasquez both use the word disappointment and disappointment a lot where other more demeaning or mean words would fit. So did he script these answers? I don't know if he scripted the answers, but I do believe that this word disappointment was something that he noted and maybe he shared with Camille and said, you know, that's like a way to stay politically correct while still saying that we weren't happy with this particular thing. Let's look at his physical baseline, because as you know, very often I look at baseline so that I know when a behavior deviates from it. So we have a couple of interesting things here. First of all, Ben Chu does move forward and back with his head like this when he talks, but his hands are quite still. Most of the time, his hands are down like this, they're together. I think this for him is, is to comfort him a little. I don't think he likes the spotlight. I don't think he's comfortable with the attention he's getting. He's gonna talk about that a little later. So I think this is just him being a little uncomfortable with this interview setting. We also have in the court TV interview, more so than the law and crime, uh, but in both, these heavy blinks. As he says something, you might see these heavy blinks. Now that's interesting because in the other interviews, on the morning shows, it really doesn't happen that often. Every now and then maybe, but really not that often. So I was really scratching my head over what this is, and during a stream earlier this week on Eric Hunley's channel, I think we got the answer. One of Eric's followers by the name of Carrie Mache or Machette, I don't know if you pronounce the T or not, said that as someone who works in video production, they believe that these blinks are a reaction to the light. And I think that that is a really, really good theory. As a lot of you know, with my career in entertainment, I've done a lot of interviews and performances on TV shows, morning shows, talk shows, including the Today Show. 
And shows like Good Morning America or the Today Show usually have bigger sets, bigger production, and the lights are quite a bit further away. In fact, you can tell if you look at him on the Today Show that there isn't a bright reflection on his hair or on his forehead. This usually indicates a light that is further away because the light disperses more. So on the Today Show, we get a very sort of soft filtered light. But if we look at the Court TV, interview, we see a reflection right on the forehead and in the Law and Crime interview, we see hard light hitting him over here on top of the hair. So this would indicate that in both those cases, there's probably a light panel pretty close to him. Furthermore, you might notice that Ben Chu has light colored eyes. He has blue eyes. And people with blue eyes are more sensitive to light than those of us who have darker colored eyes. So to me, it's very likely, and I really love this theory, that those panels are closer. In fact, I'm pretty sure that they are based on the reflections and they're causing more stress on his eyes and these heavy blinks are to correct that subconsciously. So to be clear, I think that these heavy blinks are something he does do, but because of these lights, they're just being increased and he's doing them quite a bit more. I want to go back to what I was saying earlier about Camille Vasquez passing up the opportunity to insult Amber Heard. Um, he's given multiple opportunities here to insult Elaine and her credentials and her credibility. I mean, we've all done it. We all talked about her interviews in very unfavorable ways and some things that she said that were really wrong. And yet every opportunity here to say, you know, as a self-respecting lawyer, that's not something she would have done. Not only did he not take that opportunity, but he went the other way. He says she's a very good lawyer. He talks about her experience. He doesn't get personal about it. And here's what's interesting. It's not only in his answer, it's even if you look at his face while he's being asked these questions about like, you know, you know what Elaine said and you know what she did. We're not seeing him roll his eyes. We're not seeing him give any of this, you know, sort of this look. He's just sort of sitting there waiting for the question to end and then he praises her and at the end of that he even says and his audio cuts as he's saying it but he says that she could have just misspoke that that's not what she meant her characterization and perhaps she just misspoke not only does he not insult her but he actually makes excuses for her and i think honestly that's remarkable it's it, he's a better man than i if i had someone go on this public sort of the today show and cbs morning and say all these things about me and my team I think I'd be sour about it. I think you'd see it in my face, even in my reactions to these questions. And I think I'd poke a little more. He's going the complete opposite way on that. This is the social media age. Do you believe the jurors saw any of that, were swayed by any of that? No, I don't think there's any reason to believe that the jurors violated their oath. And, that, and again, that suggestion was, was disappointing to hear. Yeah, I mean, Amber Heard's lawyer said so. She said it would have been unavoidable because it's on TikTok, it's on social media. I mean, in the, in the old days, you'd, you'd tell the jury before they went out, don't read newspapers, don't watch the evening news. Now it's everywhere. It is everywhere, but at the same time, they were admonished every single night. And uh, they had a tremendous amount of respect, I think, for the court and the process, and they were doing the best that they could. Okay, so a bit of a roller coaster here with uh, sticking to the jury and what the jury heard and what the jury did. Uh, and they're being asked if the jury saw any of what's going on on social media. Now, I want you to notice the first thing. It's really important because as they go to speak, I think they were going to kind of answer at the same time, but Camille looks over to Ben and we call this a confirmation glance, which is like, okay, well, did you, were you going to, you going to take that? And oh, no. Okay. So she's giving her answer. And at the same time, she's looking to Ben to be like, oh, that that's your answer as well. Typically with prepared answers, if they came in here and said, okay, now listen, we're going to be asked this about the jury. We need to say this. You wouldn't see that confirmation glance. You wouldn't see her look over to see, oh, okay. So that's what you think as well. You would see one of them sort of answer because that's the plan. So we're getting a very spontaneous feel in the beginning of this as they both say no, and it feels honest. It absolutely feels honest that they think, no, the jury did exactly what they were supposed to do. In fact, Ben goes on to say that. He says, there's no reason to believe that they broke their oath. Well, there's two things happening here. The question isn't specifically that they break their oath. The question is, did the jury members catch any wind of this news? Do you think that they heard any of what's going on out there? I believe that both those things can coexist. 
it's very possible that they didn't go out and look for this. They didn't go on social media, they didn't go on TV, so they respected that oath. But it's also reasonable to believe that it's possible that while they're out there going on about their lives, they might catch something, they might overhear something, they might see something at the corner of their eye. It's possible. Then to further sort of elaborate on this, Camille says, you know, they were, they were told very strictly every night what the rules were and they respected that and they did the best that they could. And again, I completely agree. It's one thing to say they respected the law, they did what they had to, but it's not a ridiculous assumption to say, did maybe one of them overhear something? Now, I totally get their position. They firmly have to defend the fact that that didn't happen because there's no evidence of that happening. There's no reason to believe that that happened. That's the perfect wording there. It's maybe reasonable to assume it could have happened, but there's no reason to believe that it did. And this is the position that they have to take because otherwise, if there's an appeal or mistrial or anything like that, it could be used against them. So I believe they both firmly believe that all these jury members stuck to that oath. But this language of there's no reason to believe and they did the best that they could, I think it sort of acknowledges that like, as far as we know, that didn't happen. Okay, now we're gonna jump to the statement from everything, from the trial, from all these interviews, from the beginning of this, the single statement that shaped my opinion of Johnny Depp the most. And I think it's massively significant. But before we do, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavior analysis. Do you think that there was, there, was there a point during the trial when you said, I think we got this, I, I think we're winning this, so even maybe even towards the closings? We didn't want to be presumptuous enough to think that we were winning because it's very hard to read the jury. But we did think that Johnny's direct testimony and his performance on cross was excellent. He writes all of his, I mean, he writes his scripts when he is performing roles. And this is no different. I mean, we had suggestions as any attorneys would, but ultimately what he says is all in his own words. Like I said, that is massively important for me. And let me tell you why. In psychology, there's a concept called psychological distancing. This is a behavior that we often see in guilty people where they use language that distances them from something that they did, that they're guilty of. So for example, if we're interrogating someone for a murder charge, instead of saying something like, I didn't murder and name the person, like I didn't murder Jessica, they say something like, I, I would never touch her, or you know, I would never lay a finger on her, or I never went anywhere near her. So it's, they don't use the word murder or kill, they put distance between them and this horrifying action and then they don't use the person's name because once again they put distance between them and the person or the location. I never went there instead of I was never in the bar. So things like that, psychological distancing. Now the opposite of that is also true. Innocent people have no problem calling it murder or kill or saying names or saying locations because they don't associate with it. They're not trying to distance from it. So throughout this trial there's been this big question mark over the whole thing which is Johnny Depp, one of the most accomplished actors in the world, can it be that he's up there putting on a performance, putting on an act? Is this just this act that we're meant to believe? What we just heard is for me, one of the biggest testaments that Ben Chu, Johnny's lawyer, 0% believes that Johnny Depp is up there putting on an act or acting. And the reason for that is because he compared what Johnny was doing on the stand to acting. And if he thought even for a second that what we saw up there was acted or fake or a presentation, he would never use the word presentation, which he did. He would never use the word script to describe what he was doing. And he would never compare what Johnny said up there to him writing movie lines. Because it's so incriminating, because it's so close to the truth, he would avoid this language at all cost. Now again, please remember there's no absolutes, but to me, it would be very, very strange to see his own lawyer use the script if that's in fact what was going on. The reason he can compare it is because in his head, what we're seeing here and acting are such different thoughts that he can draw parallels between them because what Johnny Depp was doing up there was not acting. Why do you think the jury didn't believe her? Because when you look at the verdict, it really comes down to that. The issue was, is what she's saying true or false? And by their verdict, they said, it's false. Well, my sense is that it had a lot to do with accountability, that Johnny owned his issues. He was very candid about his alcohol and drug issues. 
He was candid about some unfortunate texts that he wrote, and I think it was a sharp contrast to Ms. Heard, who didn't seem, or at least the jury may have perceived, that she didn't take accountability for anything. As you know, I love my psychology studies and I love to apply my degree in social psychology in these videos. And there's a really, really great one and practical one that we can talk about right here. So Ben is talking about how um, Johnny Depp talked about the difficult things, his struggles with alcohol and drugs and some text messages that were really unflattering and how he took accountability for those things and how Amber didn't or didn't seem to and how that played out. And he's making a really, really good point. In fact, this phenomenon that he's talking about has a term in psychology, it's called the Pratt-Fall Effect. And it was discovered by Elliot Aronson, an American psychologist in the 60s. And the study that he did was very simple. And basically what he found with this study, and I'll leave a link in the description to where you can go look it up. But what he found is, when we look at someone who is accomplished, intelligent, confident, someone who's really admirable, and we see human fault, we see something off about them, something wrong, a clumsy moment, or something less than perfect, we rank them as more likable and more trustworthy. And this was not the only study of its kind. There's been a lot of research that shows that not only when we see the fault in something that is great and big and accomplished, but when someone admits their faults, it connects us more to that person, we gravitate more not only to that person, but to that thing, to that product, to that company, and this is used in marketing a lot. In 1962, Avis was losing a lot of money, over $3 million a year, and they were losing to their competition, Hertz, who at the time was the number one, the biggest car rental company in the world. So Avis came up with a slogan, their marketing team came up with a slogan, which was, when you're number two, you have to try harder. So they publicly admit that they're number two. They're not the best. We're not the best, but we're really trying hard. And this, in the eyes of the public, made them so relatable, showed that humane side, and their sales, for the first time in a decade, were profitable by the millions. And Avis is not the only marketing campaign who has used this strategy. A lot of other companies have, including the popular cough medicine, Buckley's, and their slogan, which some of you must know, it tastes awful and it works. So we've seen again and again in marketing, in research, that when you admit your flaws, it makes you more relatable. I think Ben absolutely nailed within this answer something that had a big role to play in this trial. And that's the fact that Johnny Depp on the stand never tried to portray himself as a perfect human. He admitted his faults. Uh, he was talking about moments in his life that he's not very proud of. He didn't try to hide it. When he was cross-examined about it, there was any awkwardness. He didn't try to deny things. And then we had Amber Heard, who was pretty much the opposite of that. Instead of taking opportunities to say things like, yeah, you know what, maybe I acted a bit out of line, or I was doing this, or, you know, look at evidence that she provided two things that contradict each other and go, oh, you know, I'm so sorry. I, you know, I, I must have been confused about this. She had no fault. She kept deflecting and she kept just sort of trying to portray herself as this perfect being. And I do believe that the jury would look at that and go, yeah, no one's, no one's that perfect. Whereas had she had those little moments of admitting fault, it could have played quite a bit differently. Not since OJ, perhaps, has the trial been so closely watched and the lawyers become famous people in their own right. What has that been like for you, particularly you, Camille? I, I think I saw someone on social media get a tattoo of your face on their body, which is weird. <laughs> um, it's been overwhelming um, and surreal, but to the extent that I can encourage young women to stay in school and maybe inspire them to pursue a legal career, then it's all worth it. Well, I understand you got a promotion yesterday to partner. <laughs> well deserved. I was going to say, about time, other partner, right? Camila Vasquez, Ben Chu, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> ah, I love this one. So they're being asked about sort of the, how they're in the public eye now and this whole new fame and how everyone recognizes who they are. And we see two different smiles from Camila Vasquez, you know, at two different points of this little segment. And the first one is when she's told that somebody got a tattoo of her on their arm. And we see two things. We see a slow blink. So her eyes, this is when the eyes slowly close like this. And at the very same time, we see this tight smile with these two lines getting accentuated. And I'm gonna to try to pause on that so you guys could see it because she flashes for a second there, disgust. She doesn't like this idea. And here's what's great about this. Savannah Guthrie, the interviewer, she notices this. And she, this is a testament to how good she is at her job because she asks the question and once she sees that expression, she goes, 
which is weird. So now like she's sort of, I'm with you on this. It's weird, but she didn't say that until she saw Camille Vasquez's response because Camille Vasquez may have said, yeah, that's really flattering, that's awesome. But when she sees that sort of quick sort of flash of like slow blink and cringe, she goes, which is weird. It's, so she adds that in. Now, at this point, Camille Vasquez demonstrates exactly how you redirect a question. So last week with Elaine's answers, we talked about this a lot and a lot of people said this without me having to point it out that a question would be asked and then she would kind of stutter and say some things that are barely relevant and then answer a different question. In this case, Camille acknowledges it and then shifts for the positive and gives an answer that is related but, but focuses on one part of the question because Savannah's asking, you know, how are you dealing with all this? There's even someone who got a tattoo of you. So she chooses to answer one part of the question in a positive light. So it doesn't feel dodgy. And then she's asked about making partner and we see a whole different smile. So it's more uplifting. She's smiling with the whole face. There's that slow blink, that tight, cringy smile. She's smiling with the teeth, big open smile. We're seeing the eyes are engaged in the smile. The, the quality of the video isn't exceptional, but we can still see the crow's feet, which is the wrinkling on the side of the eyes, which happens when we're seeing a Duchenne smile, which is the word for a legitimate full smile. There's also even this giggling. She's giggling, huh? And it's coming off as a little bit nervous. And I don't know if that's because she's on TV and she doesn't really like the attention, but we are seeing real pride and accomplishment and happiness in this moment. This is a woman who's a lot happier at her professional accomplishment than someone out there getting a tattoo of her face on them High five, Camille Vasquez. And then you hear the verdict, a win on each one of Johnny Depp's claims. Well, what was your reaction? It was emotional. I mean, it was, it, we were so thrilled for him. That was great. And it was a great moment. He looked like the weight of the world was off of his shoulders. And it... Yeah. Tell us more about his reaction. And I see you becoming emotional. You became emotional during closings, too. Yeah. I mean, his life was on the line, so we felt very strongly, and we felt strongly that he did not do anything remotely like this. And we all felt that way, or we wouldn't have been working on it, so. Oh, man. So let me ask you this. Forget, forget everything I know, forget all the studies, forget all my background, forget all of it. Just on this one, use your intuition. Is this a man who is representing an abuser? Or is this a man who's representing a man who just got his life back? Forget about Johnny Depp's acting on the stand. Ben Chu is not an actor. Look at what we're seeing here. We see the tears in his eyes. We see the voice crack. We see those lips tighten up a little as those corners come down. He's feeling that emotion and we see hand to chest. This is, unless you've taken a body language course and you know to do this, when our hand goes to our chest, it's something we do with sincere emotion because there's a rush of emotion, sometimes you feel it in that heart, you feel that emotion kick in, and hand to chest is a common thing we see in those moments. And I think anybody can look at that and say, this is a man who's really, he's getting choked up, those lips are coming together as he's trying to hold back emotions, the tears are coming out, the voice is cracking. Listen, I don't talk in absolutes, I don't like to deal in absolutes at all, I think everything exists in a gray area, so you'll never hear me say something like, Johnny Depp is for sure innocent, but as far as Ben Chu goes and this behavior, this is a man who believes, and again, no absolutes, but this is a man who very likely believes that his client is innocent and deserved this verdict. He's so emotionally attached and he even says, you know, they wouldn't have worked on this if they didn't believe in him. This is extremely unlikely to be fake. We've seen nothing from Ben Chu that suggests that he has the capacity to fake this kind of emotion. You guys approached the bench with the judge. What did she say in that moment? Did you know what was happening in that moment or what the verdict may have been? We didn't, and it, we were hoping that she might give us some clues, but she played it straight down the line and said that the jury had reached a verdict on, as to one of the statements but had not filled out a damage, and she was apprising counsel for both sides that, that her, of her intent to orally instruct them to put in a damages number, but we didn't know whether that was a statement on the counterclaim or one of the affirmative three sta uh, statements in Mr. Depp's case. So we had a torturous several minutes while we were waiting for the jury to do that. The reason I included this clip is because it provides a very important answer to something I talked about last week. So in last week's video, I analyzed Amber's reaction and Elaine's reaction 
to the verdict. And I said that for me, from a behavior standpoint, there was a few things that were missing and all the details are in that video. And earlier this week, I was on a live stream on Viva Frey's YouTube channel and we were joined by the always amazing Emily D. Baker, otherwise known as Shadow. And she is an incredibly accomplished lawyer, a legal analyst, a YouTuber. She's amazing. And she said that even for her, there was just something missing. She's seen a lot of verdicts, like a lot. And she said that there was just something between Elaine and Amber in that moment that didn't seem right. In the comments, quite a few people said that the reason we didn't see those emotions is because they already knew the verdict. That when they approached the bench, they were told what the verdict was. And I'm so glad that in this interview, Ben Chu confirmed that that is flat out wrong. That they weren't told anything, they didn't know anything, they weren't shown the forms, nothing. The only thing that they knew was that something was done incorrectly in the forms and that someone had to pay someone, but that in no way indicated who had to pay who. So I'm really glad that he said that because I definitely felt that Amber, during the verdict being read, was finding out for the first time and we were seeing emotions, but not to the depth that I would expect to see given that situation. Speaking of last week's video, I want to follow up on something that I ended that video with as well, where I showed you a clip of Whitney and Amber exiting the courtroom and going to the car, and I asked you to give me some impressions in the comments. And there was some really interesting comments, a lot of really astute observations, some people caught some great stuff, some people missed a few things, there was a lot of discussions, and I want to end by talking about what it is I saw there. Actually, really quick before we get to that, because I gotta get this off my chest, I also said in last week's video that I didn't know what supers are, but they were on because my friend Eric told me to turn them on, and there was a few, really not a lot that I saw, but a few people who were like, dude, we're not dumb, we know you know what supers are, and that blew my mind, because like, why would anyone lie about something so stupid? So I, di I didn't, I didn't know what supers were, I knew what super chats were, because I've been on a few streams and I've seen them, you know, with the super chats pop up, but I didn't know what super stickers were or what super thanks were. I didn't know how it worked. And my friend told me to turn them on and I was on his stream earlier this week and I brought that up and he absolutely confirmed that I was clueless. So anyways, this isn't for the commenters necessarily, but if anyone was watching, I was like, wait, did Spidey really not know what they were? Yeah, I didn't know what they were. Okay, now moving on to Whitney and Amber leaving the courthouse to go to their car. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening there with the dynamic between the two. And to help me comment on this, I invited a very good friend of the channel that most of you know very well. This is someone who is not only really good at spotting body language, but is actually a lawyer who practices in that courthouse in Fairfax, Virginia. And his comment on the video went flying. Actually, it maxed out. I didn't know that comments can do that. You can no longer reply on his comment because it has the maximum amount of activity. So I invited him in so we can discuss a little bit what we saw in that moment. Here it is. Welcome back to the channel, Rob. And you had a really awesome comment that got a lot of activity talking about that specific scene where Amber and Whitney are seen walking out of the courthouse and into the car. And I just would love to get your opinions, you know, for all the viewers to actually walk us through what you saw there because as a lawyer, You've seen, especially a lawyer who works with a lot of families and a lot of cases similar to this, you've seen loss in the courtroom. Yeah, and I love the question that you asked and the fact that you asked that question was awesome, especially leaving it open-ended like that. Um, when you see Amber Heard leave that back door of the courthouse, now this is back behind the courthouse. Uh, it's a gated area where the cars come and pick them up. Um, and you see her walk out and Whitney's walking there with her. Whitney's walking side by side, kind of giving a sideways glance, sees how Amber is, whether she's going back seat or front seat, Amber goes back seat. And then as Whitney is getting into the car, you see a really deliberate motion with um, Amber's, or not Amber, Whitney's hand going to her phone. I felt confident in saying that that was a del deliberate motion. I'm not the expert. Um, You've seen all of this stuff. You're a lot better at picking up on the smaller things than I am. Did you have any takes on that? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for that. And I, I, that's the thing I think a lot of people sometimes don't realize about my experience where like my knowledge didn't come from books. It came from being out there on stages. And part of what I do as a mentalist, I pick up on these details and I look at the small sort of nuances of how people do things. And then it allows me to know what they're thinking or what they're about to do. And that's literally been my career. Think of one of the letters. Let me start with that. Focus on one of the letters. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a weird one. It's not a common one. W? <laughs> yes. Is that what you're thinking? Yes, it is. And you never, you never said that. I never me. said that. No, Watch. no. What? And I, I'm yeah. perfectly honest. Everything like you described about me was very accurate. Like 
Very true. It's like weird, how? I think there is a subtlety that a lot of people missed and I'm really with you on this. Now, can this be simply a gesture of her moving her phone out of the way because she's about to sit in a car and that could be uncomfortable? It could be that. But there's a reason that I personally don't think it is and here's what it is. It, the word you use is perfect, deliberate motion, something with thought behind it. So when we see her hand shoot back, if this was just something out of comfort, something you're moving out of your way, there's an obstacle that has less thought. It has less deliberate motion. So what we do is we want to move something out of the way, we grab it, we move it out of the way. When we saw her hands shoot back into her pocket, we see her get the phone. She has a good grip on it from both sides. She's got the phone, it's unquestionable. But then she adjusts her grip, not just once, but twice. Her hand slides down the side, she grabs it again, then again, and her hand quickly swings back around, all the way around. So this isn't, it's not consistent with what, what I would expect to see with someone just grabbing something, moving it out of the way. So yeah, not only do I agree, but I spoke with someone that we both know is a massive expert in this field, Chase Hughes, who literally wrote the best selling books in the world on behavior analysis. And he actually made a great point, which was about the speed at which the arm swung around once she had the phone. He thinks that the phone is something that brings her comfort. So whether, whether she's gonna look at it, take a look, look at her text, send a text, go on social media, which is something, by the way, we know that they both do. Whitney and Amber like to go on social media and see what's up and post and react. So whether it's that, he says that, that the speed at which that arm swung around indicates that this isn't just this sort of thoughtless, I'm putting this aside, but re-grip, swing around, she wants that phone. Again, it could just be that she's moving it out of the way, but to me and Chase, and it seems like you as well, it seems more consistent with, I want my phone. And I freaking love that because you just picked up on what I was going to ask you next, which is, I wondered if that was a, uh, a comfort animal, like, uh, like I needed to distract. I knew I was getting in this car and I needed that in front of me and you just hit it like right on the head. Yeah. I think either it's comfort or she needs to be on it. There's some desire to be on that phone in that moment that you just, you just feel by that deliberate motion, yeah. but the comfort part, awesome, awesome take by you and Chase. What would you say, Rob? And I quite paid a lot of attention to this as well. What would you say was happening in the vibe between the two sisters as they were walking out? And how is it different from other cases that you've seen? It's tough. It's tough because what you're seeing when they walk out, that's that's a good five to 10 minute separation from when they were in the room. And we don't know how they acted when they were in that back room together, whether there was consoling that happened back there. But when they're walking out of there, they're both walking very deliberately. I mean, that is, that isn't just a walk. That's a stride. I mean, they are, they are moving. And what I took most out of that was Whitney with her head movements, looking at Amber, she was taking Amber. Amber was in charge in that moment. And there was no question about it. Whitney is doing the double take. Whitney's seeing where Amber's going, even though not making any overt gestures there. I, something about it just showed me that Amber was really mad or upset. There was a lot of emotion coming out and Whitney was trying to be reactive to that. So I, I don't want to say that they weren't giving all that consolation in the background. They might very well have been, but in that very moment, Whitney's sole focus was on where's Amber getting? And then I need to get in this car. Love that. Love that balance sort of not jumping on the obvious train thing. I do love that. And again, what you said is perfect. We don't know what was going on in that room. We also don't know what's going on in the car as soon as those doors are closed. They're out there. They know there's cameras. They could just be rushing to get in this car. You know, we often do that. When we want to go from point A to point B, the only goal is to get in that car. I do see, um, in this case, Amber Moore as the leader and Whitney Moore as the follower. I think that's just their dynamic. We do see somebody else in the back seat. So that could have been Whitney's cue to be like, I will leave Amber with whoever that is which we could speculate on that quite a bit more. Um, I think that regardless of whether there's one more person in that big car, a very close sibling, like I'm thinking of my girlfriend and her sister, I'm thinking my mom and her sister, they would still go in that back seat with their sibling, but you can't apply a standard like that to every relationship and expect them to live up to it. But in that walkover, it seemed to me like their energies were not that connected and it was two separate people saying to themselves, we got to get in this car right now. So there it was, quite a lot of stuff we went through there, some great stuff with Ben Chu and Camille Vasquez, a great discussion with Rob from Lion Lumber. By the way, I will leave a link to his channel in the description. Make sure to give him a follow. He's putting out some awesome videos. And let me know in the comments what you thought of this. What did you think 
of Camille Vasquez and Ben Chu with these interviews. What vibes are you getting? Hope you enjoyed it. I will see you on the next one.